Okay. Ready, Ann? All right. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Public Safety Committee for Thursday, June 15th, 2023. Welcome to everybody. Um, first item of business is public comment. I have one blue card, and I'd invite our speaker to come forward. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Zach Wynn. I live here in the city. Uh, I sent a few videos in advance of this meeting. One shows a June 15th, 2020 protest and series of roadblocks that occurred just across from the park, from the just across the park from the legislature at the intersection of Buffalo and Cuga, then moving to the intersection of Cuga and Seneca Streets. There's an attempt to open the vehicle's door before it escapes through the crowd. The other shows a July 2020 protest and roadblock that occurred on Clinton Street in front of the Ithaca Police Department. At the beginning of this video, you can see an Ithaca Police Department vehicle leave the scene as the roadblock takes hold. A vehicle becomes trapped with the occupants attempting to call 911 before acquiescing to the mob's demands and saying George Floyd's name before being allowed to pass. I have personally experienced being told by Thompson County Dispatch that there was no assistance coming for stranded motorists in front of the Ithaca Police Department. And it is clear neither city or county law enforcement are capable of providing for the safety of people traveling through the city, and it is the mob, not the law, that controls the streets. I asked the sheriff, if somebody is to find themselves in this situation, what would your advice be? And to members of the Public Safety Committee, do you think this behavior is acceptable? What assurances do people traveling through the community have that this behavior will not be repeated in the future and that they themselves will not become trapped in a roadblock? It is also worth noting that the city of Ithaca is attempting to give the leader of the roadblock at the Ithaca Police Department, a Mr. Jordan Clemens, $50,000 for his organization, the Unbroken Promise Initiative. Giving $50,000 to one of the primary antagonists of the Ithaca Police Department is a clear statement on the part of the city. Ithaca City Hall is clearly not serious about repairing its relationship with the police department. The department is down 40 to 41 officers with two more set to leave this month and three to retire by the end of the year. The county must recognize that it cannot continue to rely on Ithaca City Hall, the mayor, or the common council to effectively manage the affairs of the city, specifically law enforcement. And I appeal to you to consider taking action now to ensure there continues to be meaningful law enforcement in the city. I uh, yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to address the committee? Um, uh, next I item is changes to the agenda. And I just see, I saw our sheriff is with us. Do you need to change the order or are you okay? No, we're all set, Rich. We finished sooner than I expected, so thank you. Okay. Um, then we'll proceed to minutes approval for May 23rd, 2023. Could I get a motion? Veronica moves and seconds. Questions or comments on the minutes? Seeing none, um, because Lee is going to join us perhaps on line, I'll take it by roll call. Mike? Yes. Ann? Yes. Veronica? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Right. Um, next item is chair's report. And I um, would just like to share a couple thoughts I had upon uh, um, attending the uh, victim impact panel last evening that the probation department puts on. I, I anticipate, Dan, you're going to speak about that a little bit in your report, but I, I would just say it was a really impressive um, event. I, uh, I was only there for half of it. I, I stayed to watch the um, speaker who's um, talked about the shock of um, his daughter dying in a drunk driver accident, and the rolling consequences in his life ever since. Um, and the courtroom was full of people who had received DWIs, and this was part of their sentence to attend the imp victim impact panel. And I was sitting on the side so I could see the speaker and I could also see the audience, and they were paying attention. This was. This was a powerful, powerful statement um, this gentleman shared and just how uh, painful it was. Anyway, I thought it was a really good message. So uh, I think there's going to be another victim impact panel session in the fall. Is that right, Dan? Yes. Um, I'd, I'd encourage uh, legislators if you are interested to attend. It's worth seeing that in action. Um, 
at any rate, that's my chair's report. I would proceed to county administration. Uh, Lisa Holmes, welcome. Thank you, Rich. Um, I just have one item to uh, bring to your attention. It has to do with a resolution, so I'm not sure if you want to um, move that forward or... Let's uh, put on the table the Reimagining Public Safety Community Healing Mosaic Mural, ID 11731. Can I... And moves, Veronica seconds. Do you want to speak to that? Sure, I can start, um, I can tee it off, and uh, Mona Smiley from the um, CJC is, is here with us and can speak to some more of the details. But um, this is um, a project that is within the, the current year's Reimagining Public Safety Plan under Community Healing with the idea that the, um, the or, as originally intended, the mosaic was going to be constructed indoors at the CJC, um, at, at the mental health building. Um, in recent weeks, we've been approached with the opportunity to have it be um, a more visible, in a more visible outdoor location, which involves a, a county building. Um, this morning, um, this same resolution was discussed at the FNI committee and, and moved forward, and we wanted to bring it here to the Public Safety Committee as well, because the um, while the project was already approved in the Reimagining Public Safety Community Healing Plan, it's it's changed a little bit and wanted to bring it to all of your attention. And Mona, would you like to say a few more words about it? Sure. Thanks, Lisa. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think the light that I would like to shed on the new spot and location is just the collaboration with um, Downtown Ithaca Alliance and Southside Community Center, Black Girl Alchemist, which is a group of young African-American um, young ladies that are within the Ithaca City School District and do um, emotional and um, psychological expressions through art. They are the creators of the mural over at the um, downtown Ithaca Children's Center of the late day Gandhi. Um, they take reflection of situations and express themselves through art. So they'll be looking at what community healing is to them, what um, you know relationships um, or interactions they've had with law enforcement, um, positive and negative, and reflecting on those and creating a piece of artwork um, under the direction of Anne-Marie Zwack, who is also a local artist. So it's just a bunch of collaboration with um, downtown, um, the History Center, because that's where the building will be located. Um, it's an exciting project because it'll bring more visibility to you know the effects of community healing because it won't be secluded inside a conference room. It'll be out in the public for um, everyone to view. Pretty excited about it. Looking forward to working with all the um, different um, entities on the collaboration to see it through. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Mona. Um, I guess I, I'll jump in and add, I, I think this is a great location for this. This is part of the Tompkins Center for History and Culture. This is culture. Um, and it will be far more visible. It, it's in an alley, but people walking by will see it, and it probably will entice people to walk down the alley. As you can see in our agenda, the current condition of the alley is it's spray painted. It's yet another um, instance of vandalism that I think could be made far more beautiful and beautiful in a, in a good expressive way. So I, I, I'm firmly in favor of this, but I'd invite comment from other committee members. Anne. Yeah, really glad to see that, you know, you chose to have this outside. It really makes sense to have it more visible. Just uh, one question, maybe this is already considered since, you know, sometimes there can be vandalism. It will, and maybe this was discussed in FNI, so I'm assuming this is going to have like a coating on it that makes it easier to get spray paint off and if, if that happens. I would assume so. But Mona, do you know? I don't know if that's getting too much into the weeds here. Um, that might be a little more than I know um, okay. as far as like artistic wise and supplies, but it's definitely something that I can mention into consider um, for them to take into consideration in the development of it and the materials that are going to be used. Yeah, I, I think uh, the committee would recommend some clear cut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> our, our level of expertise. So really exciting. I look forward to it. Maybe we can uh, have a little opening or something there when it, when that's done and have a have the Public Safety Committee come. Yeah, absolutely. We are going to have Rob um, kind of trailing behind and making, you know, doing some um, B-rolls as we're getting things are getting developed and the, you know, the whole process of putting it up and finishing it. So there will be definitely be some video footage and um, with the beautification and the placemaking collaboration with uh, TIA, we are looking forward to new lighting and maybe some seating in that alleyway to really, really spruce wow. it up and bring it to life. So we're looking for a pretty big reveal once it's completed. Right. Lisa. I can also share for, um, from some of the Q&A at the F&I committee meeting this morning, um, there will be a, a contract between the county, the CJC, and um, the artist about it, and that there will be um, kind of a conceptual design or sketch that is shared prior to the, the art going up. Yeah. I, as we discussed, having yes. a good understood process is really important here. Yes. So, okay. Are we ready to vote? I will call the roll. Mike? Yes. Anne? Yes. Veronica? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Great. Anything further from county administration? That I can think of. Thank you, Rich. All right. Let's proceed to our sheriff's office. Uh, welcome. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Rich. Uh, just a few things to report on uh, above my uh, written report that you have in front of you. Uh, we've been working through a lot of our new correction officer hires. Uh, we have a physical fitness test set up for this Saturday at the sheriff's office. Uh, hopefully everybody will be able to successfully pass that. Um, we've also been working on doing things a little bit different. I mentioned in the past, uh, we haven't been able to set up a full academy training for correction officers yet, but it's something we've talked about. Um, although staffing may be challenging to make that happen, but in the meantime, we have been able to do some internal training uh, where in the past we would have sent correction officers off to an outside school. Uh, we just put eight new hires through a defensive tactics type training course uh, where they learn the use of pepper spray. Um, that's a tool that's quite often, uh, unfortunately, used in our jail uh, when incidents has happened. Uh, so it was nice we were able to knock that off right here locally and I have to send people off. And the benefit of that is uh, we get to train them the way we want them uh, to be trained. Uh, we get to incorporate de-escalation tactics and uh, proper reporting tactics for when uh, that has to be deployed. Uh, our deputy sheriff uh, test has been announced. Uh, deadlines to sign up for that test is August 7th. So uh, we've been working with people in the county, uh, Dominic, Larry Workman, and, and Mona to uh, get some help with uh, recruiting efforts. So it stands to see how we'll, how we'll do with that. We do have a handful signed up already uh, with quite a bit of time still to go to get those applications in. Uh, we had a retirement today. Don Calkins was a deputy that had over 30 years uh, public safety uh, experience in our county. Uh, she was the first uh, female deputy sheriff actually to retire from the sheriff's office uh, law enforcement division. Uh, so we'll be sad to see her go. Uh, we also uh, are gonna have a retirement in the jail, Joanne Petras, who is our forensic counselor. If you've been around uh, a while, uh, you're familiar with her work. She uh, does a lot of one-on-one -on work, uh, one -on -one work with our inmates and also uh, group training sessions with them and has just been a huge asset to the Sheriff's Office and our community. And if you remember, she participated quite heav heavily in our crisis response team and actually was quite successful in uh, negotiating uh, subjects down from pretty uh, volatile situations. So. Uh, that's the bad news that we'll be losing her, but we were very fortunate because these positions are very difficult to fill. Uh, we have Michelle Fulkerson that just recently uh, started with us and she'll be taking over for Joanne and they'll get have some time to work together to get her up to speed. Um, so that's it. A uh, lot of staff changes and uh, some good things going on. So. Well, congratulations to jo Joanne and Don. They've certainly contributed for many years and done great work. Um, I, if you could just share with the committee a little bit the status of the Give Grant, because it seems like there's some good news yeah. there, and 
I, I don't want to get into a discussion right now with of where we're going to go with the grant, but maybe you could just give a very brief summary. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had received the award letter um, last Friday. Uh, we were granted the full 382 plus or minus $1,000. Uh, we're trying to create a, a task force on how we're going to respond to violent crime. We've been working with the Ithaca Police Department and other partners in, in the county. Uh, and like Rich said, we're just developing these plans now and trying to figure the best way uh, out to uh, tackle this issue. And uh, certainly more will be uh, forthcoming in future meetings for sure. I guess I would just add, I, I think you're using a very good approach in terms of involving the police chiefs from all of the agencies around the county and trying to go forward in a concerted way. Uh, mm. Makes good sense. Um, yeah. Questions for the sheriff? Yeah. Veronica. Um, I guess this may be a silly question, um, but we don't seem to be short on time. I noticed there's a bunch of uh, just speaking of forensic counseling, thank you notes in our packet um, for a presentation that yeah. two folks did at TST BOCES. Um, so thanks for sharing that. A couple tidbits that caught my eye was, um, sorry, I bookmarked this. Um, one person talking about using a dog method to get confessions out of people but saying that they felt like if they were brought into an interrogation room, they would be word, weirded out by a dog being in there. Someone else <laughs> says, it was very fun what you said at the end of class, but I know that we would never do that because we all have respect for our own body and we would never share it with the internet. So I'm curious, what did they present about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I could uh, clarify the dog. Yeah, go ahead, Jen. I'm reading it right now because <laughs> that is a good question. It ain't a funny one. Well, years ago, we incorporated um, an emotional support dog into our jail, uh, at, uh, and he's often used in group settings for um, group counseling sessions. So I'm, I'm assuming they were referring to that. Not it's not used in interrogations. It's used <laughs> in, it really will calm people and uh, uh, kind of distract them. Allow so often the pet the dog to kind of distract them, and then they kind of get talking and opening up in group settings and in individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with Joanne. So there might have just been a misinterpretation or a misclarification of what that was. Uh, I'm assuming that's what it was because we've never utilized a dog in an interrogation setting. Yeah, not to mention, uh, I think what is he, a Pekingese or a Shih Tzu or something? He's not very intimidating. Uh, and if anything, he, he probably wouldn't solicit confessions, but he does solicit a lot of food and snacks from people in the jail, so. <laughs> Um, and then the other, um, uh, one of the, the people that went was um, an investigator, Skevel, who's part of the scent. He's an investigator, so I'm imagining he might have touched on just um, personal security online, not sharing images to people you don't know. Um, that would be my best guess without having attended. Um, but I know the general topics that were discussed were the, the benefits of the crisis, crisis negotiation team and just some of the things that the investigators do at our Cool. Thank you. I appreciate that little, uh, even if it's speculative, window into it. Anybody else? There was one area um, I, just, I did want to touch on. Our jail numbers have been running quite a bit higher than they were last year. And just I invite comment from anybody, um, you know, why we think this might be happening. Do you, and particularly, do you see anything different in how our local judges are approaching um, bail decisions or no bail decisions? I, I, and Matt can certainly speak to this, but I haven't seen anything change as far as our justices are concerned. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I say the same thing every month, and I know I express it. I think it's just a, a momentary blip, but. I recognize that it has lasted maybe a little longer than we, we thought it would, but um, yeah, I can't really add anything more, maybe Matt. Sure, I mean, it, it, it's, it is not because of any change in the bail law or any change in how the judges are applying bail decisions. I can, I can say that definitively. Uh, there are a few people who are waiting for trials uh, and they've been waiting for a while. Uh, there are people who are there waiting for mental health beds or psychiatric facility beds. 
There are drug court sanctions. Uh, it's a combination of things. There's there's a couple of parole violators, but uh, you know that that's there is no one. And here here's Lance with his hand up. <laughs> Lance is going to tell me it's because of the bail law changing. <laughs> Lance, what do you think? No, I, I'm not. It, it, but because I'm I'm there, and my attorneys are are at, at actually everyone. Both Matt and the sheriff are correct. There's I don't think there's any real change in crime. The only slight change you're seeing, which is is still kind of a residue fallout from COVID and stuff, we're seeing more uh, warrants on on failures to appear, what we call willful and persistent failures to appear, often of which go all the way back into the pandemic kind of residue. So there, that it accounts for a little bit of that increase, but otherwise, it's like as as Matt said, there's a number of diverse factors there. But the change in the bail law itself, the recent one, it hasn't had an impact uh, to date. Do you think that there was uh, some difference in how the willful and persistent warrants were treated during the pandemic that? Well, I think uh, we're if holding. I can talk about this, uh, yeah. and Lance can, can as well, uh, it, it takes a long time for a judge to make that determination that someone has willfully and persistently missed court. Uh, our judges don't abuse that, in my view, uh, they, and it takes a long time for that finding to be made. And so some of those uh, individuals who have had that finding made have missed many court appearances going back to the pandemic. No, I, I think, you know, Matt, <clears throat> I don't, I don't disagree with them. A lot of what happened during the pandemic, the, the local courts shut down for a while. They were kind of on and off, and, and a lot of people got, we've always had some people pre-bail, you know, for as long as I've been an attorney, uh, a small percentage who have, shall we say, difficulties coming to court. Uh, uh, so they, you know, eventually what happens is, uh, Derek's office has to go issue with him an invitation to come with them to come to court, uh, shall we say. Um, but what happened during the pandemic with all this shutdown and a lot of our clients, their phone, you know, they change phones, addresses, and stuff. They get lost and they, uh, so they, it goes a long time before warrants are issued and they get pulled back in and they're generally held until they then can be brought into court and some of them get released, some don't. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of what's going on there. That'll probably tail off here uh, as they work through that backlog for the most part. There'll always, unfortunately, be uh, a few people who always seem uh, uh, to be a struggle to get into court. Okay. I, I think this is really helpful information because it makes sense that these warrants wouldn't be chased really aggressively during the pandemic, but they're, they'd, you'd get a backlog. And so that's yeah. perhaps what we're seeing now, and that would explain our numbers being a little bit lower before and a little bit higher now. Yeah. Okay. It's, I mean, doing caps and reviewing the caps, it's only this year we're really starting to see these warrants identified as willful and persistent, you know, failures to appear. So. Okay. All right. Um, moving on, we have a resolution, authorization to accept the Department of Justice Controlled Equipment Funding, Sheriff's Office, Stock ID 11718. Could I get somebody moving that? And moves, Veronica seconds. Uh, Sheriff, would you like to speak to this? Sure, I can simply say uh, we have one aerial device currently, and this will be a second one. We did. Uh, uh, put a lot of time into training uh, two of our deputies that are now certified uh, drone operators. Uh, it's become a really excellent tool, especially in, in searching and locating missing people. Uh, it goes hand in hand with our Project Lifesaver program as well. Um, it's not something we use a lot, um, but when we need it, it's certainly a, a good tool to have. Okay. Questions, comments? I'll call the roll. Mike? Yes. Ann? Yes. Veronica? Yes. All right, and the chair votes yes. So, thank you. Anything else for the sheriff? We'll move on to our district attorney. Uh, welcome, Matt. 
Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I don't really have much to report. The data analyst is is uh, has been here for a couple of weeks, and she is uh, getting acclimated and, and working on a, a dashboard uh, and collecting data. And she's also working with um, the Give program. There will be a data component to that. So uh, she went through an all-day training yesterday uh, as part of that program, and. So I think she's going to be great uh, going forward. We've got a trial starting on Monday or Tuesday, uh, not Monday. Monday is a holiday, uh, and several more trials scheduled into the fall. Okay, um, I see you have a resolution, appro appropriation from contingent fund forensic pathologist testimony, Doc ID one one six seven three. Could I put yes. that on the table? Somebody move it, All right? Veronica moves and seconds, All right? Um, do you wanna to speak to this? Sure, sure. Uh, <clears throat> the county uses Dr. Stoppaker to provide forensic autopsies uh, in homicide cases. And uh, he has been asked to testify a grand jury as well as uh, a couple of trials coming up this year. and has indicated that those fees are separate from anything the county pays him for the, the autopsies. His testimony is separate, and he is billing us at $300 an hour. Uh, so those are estimates that would uh, be based on the, the case. The, there's two cases in particular that he would have to testify in, uh, and uh, the amount of time that we think he will spend. That is not something that's in my budget to Typically, it's, it's, it's an expense that fluctuates from year to year. We haven't had this expense in many years, uh, so that's, that's why it's a separate uh, resolution. And knowing that because this came before uh, the Budget Committee, um, if these cases plead out, you would not need to spend this money, but this allows you to have it and to proceed. Right. Well, we've already spent a little bit of it. He's testified at grand jury in one of the cases, but uh, certainly if, there, if the cases don't go to trial, we would minimize that amount. Questions or comments? Ready to vote? Mike? Yes. Ann? Yes. Veronica? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Okay. Uh, Matt, anything, anything else? I'm open for questions. Okay. Any questions for our district attorney? Um, actually, I do have a question. Have you heard anything about these incidents where traffic was blocked in front of the Ithaca Police Department? My understanding is that is from a couple of years ago, if not uh, 2020. Okay. So I, if those are the incidents he's talking about, I've, okay. of course I've heard of them. All right, I thought it was something recent. Okay. Now, I, if it's something recent, I have not heard of it, and I'm, I would be very surprised if that was the case. Okay, thank you. Um, we're proceeding at pace here. We're gonna go to the Department of Emergency Response. And I see we have Jeff Dunn with us here in, in room. And Michael, you're online. Yes, um, thank you. Good afternoon, Rich. Um, I'll keep my comments short because I know Jeff is in there to do a brief um, update on SIREN. Uh, just a quick, uh, couple quick notes. Uh, we did receive the variance approval today uh, regarding the backup center. Uh, that had delayed uh, the progress there, but I'm very pleased that we were given the approval today. Uh, we also supplied the Public Safety Committee with some updated EMS data, and Joe is with me today if there's any questions regarding that. And I'll just yield the rest of my time unless there's questions to Jeff, who I think needs about 10 minutes to update uh, the committee on SIREN. Um, is Joseph there? Or? Oh, there he is, yes. Um, I did have a question, just if you could speak for a minute to the number of EMTs we have in the county. Yeah, um, so I, I did send over uh, shortly before today's meeting um, some, some, di or some tables for you guys, but um, ultimately we have 279 certified EMS personnel here in our county. Um, however, of that 279, 49% um, of them are career staff, 
39% of them are either Cornell or Ithaca College students that are here for a short period of time and hopefully go on to bigger and better things. 12% um, are strictly volunteers and 10% are either a career or a mix of career and volunteer providers. Um, and 19 providers that live in our county are certified EMS providers. They are affiliated with an agency, um, but they do not run EMS funds. Um, so ultimately, the number of volunteer personnel that we have in our county is 61. Um, thank you for doing all that homework. And my follow-up question is, what do you think are the right numbers? Where do, this is our starting point, and we're gonna to try to increase our training capability. Where do you think we should try to end up? I think, uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I think that's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, ideally, I would love to see us, you know, 150 volunteers and have a thriving volunteer um, community. Um, but at the same time, I know that volunteerism in EMS is on the decline across the board. It's, it's not just our county that's suffering. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, for individuals to uh, maintain their full-time job, their work-life, family balance, and um, also find the, the time to volunteer because uh, it's not just the amount of time they spend on the road. Um, it's also the amount of time that they spend recertifying their certifications every couple of years. So um, I, I would love to see the number go up some, um, but I'm also going to be a little uh, <laughs> realistic and realize it may not go up very much. Yeah, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, although I guess I just did. Um, but as I said, we, we have a baseline here, and obviously we would, we would not want to go any lower. But if we're going to put effort into let's get our training program underway. It would be a good idea, I think, to have some, some goal setting of what is, what is optimal. Um, and of course, it would include arriving at those numbers, but then what's our replacement rate? And so we might want to start thinking about those, those numbers as well as, as we proceed. Yeah. Anyway, does anybody else have questions, comment for? Joseph, on the EMS information. I have to admit, I, I saw your email. I did not review it yet, so I'm gonna do that and, and perhaps we could talk offline if I have further questions. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to comment real quick, but um, you know, as Rich said, and you said, Joseph, we might not know where we're going, but I'm really glad that Rich asked that last meeting and, and just so we have a, a baseline then from here. Okay. And Rich, just on that note, we are working now with three uh, community-based uh, departments that have an interest in putting um, about a dozen folks through the EMT program, and Joe is working with them and trying to align some training for them. So I think that's a part of it, just being able to react and work with the community-based services as they identify potential EMT um, candidates. All right. All good news. So thank you for your work on this. Um, and then... Uh, what, what would you like to, where would you like to go next? Jeff, do you want to sure, talk sure. to us? I'd love to spend a couple of minutes with you. And you, you mentioned, uh, Rich, that the meeting was moving right along and then it comes to me. So I'll try <laughs> to keep it brief. So you we take are, your time we're made on schedule here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, if this is gonna let me do this. All right, okay. There you go, okay. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to give you a little update on where we are with, uh, with SIREN, our mass notification system. Uh, I'll start with just a little uh, brief background. You remember that it was in um, the spring of 2022 that we began transitioning from what was SWIFT 911 uh, to this new platform um, from RAVE Mobile Safety. Uh, RAVE is the same company that also uh, uh, works with Ithaca College, Cornell University, uh, Cuga Medical Center, and, uh, and now Guthrie on, on their uh, alerting. Um, some of those, of course, are internal. Uh, in our case, we have both internal uses and external uses of, uh, 
uh, of the system for our community. Uh, at the end of the year, at the beginning of 2023, end of 2022, uh, it was determined that since uh, it was, it, we could not realize how much of the information in the old SWIFT 911 system that had been migrated over to SIREN was actually uh, accurate. I mean, there were many cases in which people moved away, they changed phones, they got rid of their landlines, whatever the case may be. And so the decision was made to, okay, let's, let's eliminate any data from SWIFT out of the SIREN system. So here we are about six months later, uh, and this gives us a true picture of how, um, how many people have signed up, how many people are, are, are using it. Uh, I also have some notes here about uh, the agencies and our uh, municipal partners and, and, and how they're using it. So, so here are the numbers as of June 1st. Uh, roughly, you know, just over 18,000 uh, profiles or accounts are in the system. So these are people who've actually gone in, uh, they've opted in, they've given their name, their address, their, you know, what, how much information they, they chose to reveal. And then there is another roughly 8,000 who just opted in for text messages only. So an SMS opt-in and they would receive only text messages in an emergency situation. So you add those two numbers together, you can safely say we're at over 26,000 individuals have interfaced with some regard with SIREN. So that's roughly 25% of our, our county population. Um, I, I looked at the report, if you, you saw the report from Buffalo and the snowstorm uh, over the holidays, uh, which proved very deadly, uh, but the after action report indicated the communication was a concern and that roughly 16% of Buffalo's population had opted into their, their alert system, Buffalo Alert. So I said, well, how does that compare with how we're doing? Obviously, we're at about 25% for the county. I took the city of Ithaca and roughly 18% of the city population has opted in to receive emergency messaging. So we're a little better in that regard, but you know, we've got some way to go. But everybody I've talked to said, hey, these numbers are pretty good given that this is a voluntary system. We do not require people to, to sign up for this. Um, Siren also imports uh, landlines, so they're, you know, in the, in the case that we wanted to reach out to everybody who had, say, an, who had opted into the, the system, in addition to landline phones, which would include, uh, you know, office phones and maybe some that don't even have a, have a person answer them, there's another 29,000 that are in there. Okay, we don't use that. We would only use that in, in extreme cases where we want to try to reach as, as many people as possible. Uh, we also have access to wireless emergency alerts. So uh, that would go to every cell phone uh, a person in, in the county. This is under the same system that is used for amber alerts and for severe weather alerts from the National Weather Service. And just for clarity, that isn't dependent upon area code, right? It, it senses if there's a cell phone that, and that sends the message. Correct. Okay. Correct. It, it would be a cell phone within our footprint, which is the county, the border. Correct. And that would be like actively in the area, not just one that's registered, right? It actually knows which ones are here. It would be what are in the area at that time. At that time. Uh, exactly. Cool. Exactly. And then uh, the WIA, the, the Wireless Emergency Alerts, is also part of IPAWS, Integrated Public Alert Warning System, which would take not only your, your, um, uh, your cell phones, but also your uh, radio and television emergency alerts that would appear at the bottom of your screen, as well as um, uh, NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA now allows us to use uh, their weather radios for non-weather emergencies, as well as weather emergencies. So in, that would be in the rarest case where we would have to alert, you know, the entire county. And that would only be under the direction of, in our protocol, it would be the direction of the county administrator, uh, the sheriff, or the director of emergency response or their designees. 
So here are the numbers of alerts that have been issued this year uh, up through uh, May. Um, as you can see, there was a big uptick in April, and that is because, as we'll see in a minute here, the city of Ithaca uses uh, the system for the uh, street cleaning. So they were sending out almost daily messages on street cleaning in April. Um, I don't believe that went into May as much as May was road construction. So there were many alerts being sent out about road closings or scheduled construction, um, you know, reduced traffic, that kind of thing. Uh, so for those uh, five months, you had 144 alerts across seven municipalities or, or partner agencies, okay? Um, two to one ratio of non-emergency messaging versus emergency messaging. Okay, and even though we, we refer to SIREN as an emergency notification system, well it is, but the, the truth of the matter is most of the messaging is non-emergency in nature. And it is general information to uh, the community or to a particular municipality. So here's who's using SIREN. We have Tompkins County and that includes anything that is asked of our dispatch center to send out alerts. In those cases, it's usually the city of Ithaca. Uh, police are asking for uh, notification be made. Uh, the city, uh, we, when I say the city, that would be City Hall, and they tend to issue only alerts that are based on the street cleaning, uh, odd even parking, uh, road construction, hydrant flushing, that type of thing. And then we have uh, the village of Dryden, Shermansburg, Hugo Heights, they've been using it from time to time. Uh, the town of Ithaca has begun using it uh, now that we're into the, the construction season. Uh, and then there are a couple of groups that use it for uh, internal communication that would be bangs as well as uh, New York State Police. And then I just wanted to kind of give examples of the emergency versus non-emergency alerts. Um, and, and these are pretty self-explanatory and, and you know, I, I think you look at emergency as something of a situation that's emerging, urgent, or critical. Um, so, you know, in the case of an emergency message, it's going to be, you know, something that's, you know, police activity, fire activity, uh, road closures uh, that are, you know, of immediate nature. Uh, if there's a shelter in place message, which we did have at one point, um, or a missing person uh, recently, uh, these would all be considered emergency messaging. Uh, non-emergency is anything that is basically scheduled or of a um, community uh, service, such as uh, don't forget to vote, or uh, you know, we had a couple of villages who sent out voting reminders to their uh, constituents. Okay, so I think as we move forward, um, I was very encouraged actually this month, we've added two new towns that have started to use it, the town of Newfield, um, as well as, um, uh, I mentioned the town of Ithaca with their highway department now is starting to use it for the, any uh, paving projects or, or construction work that's going on. So I think you know, we, we want to you know, continue to impress upon our communities that this is a tool that can be used uh, to help get messaging out, as well as getting people you know, signed up even though they're not required to. Uh, we'd like to encourage them to do that. And, uh, I do have many of the municipalities in their, in their monthly newsletters now have a, have a segment in there that, you know, explains SIREN and to encourage them to sign up. Are there any questions on SIREN? I have two other slides. Okay, go ahead, Van. Thanks for this uh, update, Jeff. The, uh, so two questions. So f I like the idea for road work because, mm -hmm. you know, we know that impacts people quite a bit. Are, is the, our county highway department using it? Yes. Okay. Yep. And uh, how, and so some municipalities are using it for road work and things like that, but of course that's all voluntary, I understand, but so s the more the better. But. Correct. Well, there you, if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's our highway department sending out the messages, mm -hmm. and Patricia Hardy in, in the department is responsible for getting that out, and she has a quite a uh, extensive distribution list. We will take that and we will put that on siren to those municipalities affected, 
Okay, if it's a local project, say it was uh, you know Dryden Village DPW doing something, that would be sent out by the Village of Dryden. That wouldn't be sent out through us. Right, yeah. only for the county roads. So the, and my last question was, so for instance, the state doing either road work or NYSEG or s some other utility doing tree cutting, is has that been looked at to get integrated in here? Well, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, one point that I, I failed to mention that I should have is that we send out alerts based on requests. So we have to be, you know, the request has to come in to to issue an alert, okay? We just don't pick it out of the air and say, okay, we're gonna send this out. Um, the state does have their own, uh, the New York alert. And of course we encourage everyone to, you know, sign up for as many alerts as you can because you never know. Um, in the case of the, the weather or the ambers, they're gonna come automatically uh, to your phone. Um, but in terms of some of the other ones, like the utility replacement, um, you know, that's a, you know, that is a good avenue to maybe uh, approach them on and see if we can um, impress upon them to let us know when they're doing that kind of work. And we have no problem with putting that on. So we could put it out or they could go through the state alert system? Right. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah. All right, I just want to touch upon another initiative of our department. Actually, for... before you get there. Oh, sorry. Veronica. Sorry, Veronica. Oh. Uh, sorry, I was looking through my own siren profile and getting distracted. Yes. Um, but a couple questions about that. I noticed um, you can opt in to notifications from a bunch of towns that aren't using siren. Is that just there for like a potential future when they do hook into it? Exactly, exactly. However, we may send something out on their behalf. So just because they haven't, they haven't utilized the system that means they haven't had somebody within their office go through the training. Uh, they could still send us a note to say, I, I'd like to put this on. And that's happened in a couple of cases. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and one other question, and I know you and I talked about this mm -hmm. like on the phone once before, but I see when I log into my Siren profile, it asks me if I would like to provide my COVID-19 quarantine and health status. And then if I do, I can put in like a lot of physical and health information mm -hmm. potentially. Um, can you, I just say some more about like how that's used or how that would show up. I'm not concerned about privacy because I see this as voluntary, but like right. for folks who would like to share these things. So that's part of, it, it is, it, it's data that is collected, but not necessarily used, uh, used, by our dispatchers. So we did not sign up for, or we are not part of the SMART 911, which would be that information would sit in a database for, our, for the 911 center to look at. However, that's, that doesn't mean that that information can't be used by another 911 center somewhere else where SMART 911 is implemented. Does that make sense? So uh, if you were to put that information in and you traveled to Long Island, Suffolk County, where they do have Smart 911, that information, if you were to call 911, would f pop up on their screens, okay, with your information about, you know, something specific to you, okay? The, the other part of that, and, and, you know, we've talked about for years creating registries of individuals in our community who need extra assistance, the functional needs community, right? And this is a tool, if we can have some of those groups who, who work with these clients and can encourage them to sign up for SIREN, put as much information about themselves as they can, what we can do is we could actually go through and identify where those people are and if necessary, send them, a, send them a message. So that would be in the event of, uh, you know, if we needed to evacuate an area and we needed to find out, okay, how many are immobile or have uh, ability issues? And is that something that you could, in theory, create without, like, signing up for Smart 911? 
or purchasing it or whatever you would say? Yeah, you no, know, you can, yes, you can. It's, it's a matter of the individual filling out as much information as they can. Okay. Okay. But I guess I'm saying, so it's like, um, so I see the individual can go and fill in information in their profile, but because Tompkins County emergency response has not like what, opted in, signed up, what should I be saying? For the smart 911 capability, that information won't show up automatically at Dewar if that someone is calls 911. But if, are you saying that you could like go look at that information actively? Okay. Yes, yes, you, you, that, that's a perfect way to describe it, correct. Thank you. And I, I had a, just I guess a comment that the differential in um, percentages, overall county 26% and city 18%, do you think that is reflecting the students that they, they didn't uh, it Very well, could be, because they are, it, it, they're reach. in their own systems. Okay. So they've, they've signed up for the IC or the Cornell alerts, correct. Is yeah. it crossover? Do we share with Cornell and IC or no? No. Okay. No. All right. No, we do. We did create a list. Uh, one of our notification list is CU alerts and IC alerts. So, and that's primarily designed for those individuals who live in around those institutions. So, in those neighborhoods. Okay. okay. So that if something were to be happening on campus, that you know, may, may affect people who are off campus, um, we can then send an alert, that alert, or repeat the alert that was sent from Cornell or IC. Okay. Right. Um, and how would you compare Siren to where we were with SWIFT a year ago? Siren is much, uh, I, I've always said this, it, it's, it's much more user friendly. Uh, it, it's, it, it's like three steps uh, for somebody to to put their information in and, and pick the uh, the notification list they want to be a part of, and then how do they want to receive them, either by phone, text, or email? Um, it, it's a, and it, it's less, for lack of a better term, less bulky than what we had with with Swift. And participation yeah. rate is higher with Siren. Is that correct? It is correct. And do you have any thoughts on how we could get that percentage even up from 26%? I think a quarter is pretty good. It is, yeah. But it seems like there's still fruit out there to pick. Yeah, there's, there's still pockets that we need to address. And, and I think, you know, it's, we've talked in within the office of, do, you know, launching a new, uh, um, you know, public relations campaign, some kind of, uh, you know, effort to, um, to get, let people know that this is a, you know, this is available to them, and here's the advantages to signing it up for it. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe something at the DMV, you know, that people stop by to do oh, right. that business. Maybe they could be encouraged to jump in on Siren. But yeah, there's a. If you if recall, we did have quite a few printed materials and pamphlets that were uh, created at the beginning of the launch, and we can definitely restock. With, with some of those agencies. I've, and, and guards. I mentioned it several yeah. times yeah. Uh, at our meetings, yeah. but I don't know how many people paid attention yeah. to anything and I, I do I, I was at the Village of Dryden not too long ago and they ran out of the, uh, and so we, we stocked them up and they're, they're ready to go again, so. Yeah. Anne. Yeah. This is actually almost winds up being a follow-up to what you were asking, Rich, about getting more people to mm. sign up and looking at, you know, the limited number of municipalities and so I was going to say, I'll work on the town of Ulysses, which I see is not on here. And I'm just wondering, not, not, you don't have to answer this mm -hmm. now, but I'm just thinking, would it, would it be to go after those municipalities, you know, in some way to get them to sign up? Yep. Can, can we help or, can, you know, because mm -hmm. if you get the municipalities, mm -hmm. they have newsletters right. where they go out right. to thousands of people and they're, they'd be asking, you know, they say, hey, we signed up. Please sign up so we can send you these things about the mm -hmm. things that are going on. Now, like, when you said the Ulysses wasn't, you, you meant they're not in the list of the users. Right. Correct, yeah, okay. So if the town of Ulysses did, then they'd be putting out on their... Right. Does it cost you the town? No. 
Okay. There's no right. cost to the uh, municipal partners at all. Let's get, and let's get them signed up. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is a, we're not going to point figures, but I mean, we have reached out. Sure. And, they, sure. and in fact, there have been those in the town who have gone through the training, and um, but yeah, for whatever reason, they may be reluctant to, you know, use mm -hmm. it to send send notices out. Well, maybe as legislators, we can help work on that. Okay. Through our municipal. I love that. I mean, you mm -hmm. got the city of Ithaca, so it's up to me. And is Lansing in here? No, I've totally Lansing's succeeded. not here. See? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've succeeded. <laughs> Veronica did it. Well, I, I misspoke earlier when I said the town of Ithaca started this month. It's the town of Lansing. So they just started oh, sending okay. out in June. So they're so, and those signed numbers up. aren't on there. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll get you. I'll work on you. And, and Newfield's the other one that started that had long had long been right, not doing Newfield. anything. So okay. we're getting there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Veronica. Just briefly to put out an idea that signing up for Siren seems like, at least for folks on the computer all the time, a thing that's very easy to do but one might not get to. So I wonder if there are like classes or meetings with a lot of people on their computers, reaching out to people leading those and say, hey, could you take a few minutes to be like, hmm. before we start, everyone go here, sign up for Siren. Okay, great. Thank you. Now we're going to move on. I, like, it's the kind of thing that professors at Cornell classes will be mm. asked to do for unrelated stuff. Some, that might not be our target, because like you said, they're, those right. students are all automatically in the Cornell system, but just a thought. Yeah. You had a couple other... Okay, I was just going to also um, uh, tell you about a, this initiative that we sort of re-emerged re uh, at the end of last year. So. Um, many of you know about the Citizen Preparedness Corps. This is a, a, a program that the state started back in 2014, um, and it's led by a Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, the New York National Guard, and the local emergency uh, management. And uh, since 2014, over 359,000 New Yorkers have gone through the training, um, which basically gives you um, the tools to uh, prepare uh, to respond to and recover from disasters and emergencies that occur or may occur in their communities. So the program was on hold uh, during COVID. Uh, it started up again uh, in August of uh, 2023 or 2022 at the New York State Fair. And our idea was we want to have those now every other month in our community. So we scheduled um, we've scheduled several, um, beginning in September um, in Lansing, and then we moved to the city in November. We had, and then we took the winter off because winter's always iffy about with weather and all. Um, so we got it going again in March at Danby uh, Enfield last month. Uh, we're gonna our next session is in Varna, uh, July 12th. And then uh, we're going to do a program at the shops at Ithaca Mall for our emergency preparedness and safety fair uh, to mark National Preparedness Month in September. So uh, this is, you know, prior to the pause, um, we were maybe doing one a year in the area. So, you know, I'm very proud that we've been able to do these a little bit more consistently and, and, and get uh, good attendance. Um, the BJM GAC events, a little bit of an anomaly. There were over 120 registered, and we, we said, oh, wow, that's great, you know? And the, and the state was like, oh, how are we gonna bring all those kits here? Um, but what happened, I, I think, in hindsight, since only about 40 people showed up, we were so excited when we, we finalized that that we put the word out like a month before the event, and everybody signed up. There was a big response to it. And then there was no follow-up. Uh, we learned that the state, unless there is a change in location or the session is canceled, the state doesn't do any follow-up. So beginning with Danby, I made sure that a week before I would get a copy of the roster so that then I could make my own reminders to people. And, and you know, the response, you know, I'd get reactions like, oh, thanks for the reminder, I almost forgot, or, you know, we'd get a better reflection early on of how many people were going to show up or if more people were going to show up. So, you know, you, you throw that out, but, you know, the numbers are pretty consistent. 40, 40 to 80 people uh, come to these, and we're trying to hit every municipality or every region of the county uh, with this program. So, 
and that's it. Questions? Ann. I took the training, I think it was this training in Enfield a couple yes. years back, and I would like to take it again. There was so much information, and I was thinking all elected officials, I mean, there's a lot of people that should take it, but I was thinking all elected officials, There's because we have a role in this, and so uh, are there any, do you have scheduled for the next year or into 2024 I haven't scheduled yet? out through, through September at this time. Okay. So, yeah. How but long, how we don't have it? to do we don't have to do large scale. It was like session. three we can do three sessions hours for or individuals something? or for small groups. Was it like three hours or no, something? No, no, it's actually about an hour and fifteen minutes. Hour and fifteen minutes? Yeah, they actually they 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 set aside two hours, but the program's actually about an hour and fifteen minutes. Yeah, there's a lot of information in there. It could almost be like if we did one for, say, just elected officials or something to go slower through it because there's stuff I was like, oh, we we need to do that and ha yeah. Yeah, there and is an hour and fifteen minutes. We could almost do it as part of a legislature meeting. That's true. Or we could start early. Scary thought, but we could start early so we don't have to have true. staff here unless yeah. they want to come. Yeah, Jessica has a hand up there. Here, Jessica. Hi, um, I'm driving, so I'm not gonna turn my camera on. Um, I just wanted to make a mention that, Annie, I think what you're speaking about is um, the tier three training that elected officials and other um, municipal officials, fire chiefs, um, those other community officials can take um, that goes through roles and responsibilities of those officials during an emergency along with some of the other preparedness stuff. Um, and we could schedule that through our office. Uh, the regional staff for DHSES uh, emergency management does that training locally. So um, we could schedule that at any time for any municipality or mm -hmm. governing body. Okay, so there is a program. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. I wonder if we could have both of those because you kind of like the first one's like a basics kind of. Then there's another we level? We absolutely can. Um, I can probably the best thing to do would be to send out, I can send out an email looking for the best times to be able to do it because the one program is about a three to four hour program. Okay. It generally generates a lot of questions. It's going to take some time for scheduling for, especially for legislators and town supervisors and whatnot. So um, probably to send an email of when the best time to schedule it is would be best. So I can, I could, but we can definitely start working on that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. I, I, because Ann, that was the program you referred to was was in Enfield about two years ago, right? That the, so the, the leaders, the, the tier, the, the, the tier, th tier three. Yeah, that yeah. was. I was like everybody. We all need to have that. Yeah, I think I might have gone to that. It was. Um, it, it was at the Enfield Fire Hall. Yeah, yeah. and it was declaring yeah. emergencies and yeah. Okay, that, this this is a good reminder, and this would be a good thing to do. So, thank you. Anything else? No, thank you very much. Okay. Well, all right. Um, we will proceed to the Department of Probation and Community Justice. Uh, and I see Dan and Carla are here. Um, welcome. Thank you, Rich. Um, thank you for coming to the Victim Impact Panel last night. Um, oh, thank you for inviting us. Certainly. We were, that was our first panel back in the courthouse since November of 2019. Um, there were 62 participants there. Um, these, are, these are the new folks. We had cleared our backlog of people who didn't get to attend during COVID by having three smaller sessions over here at the probation department last fall and early winter. But we're very excited to be back at the courthouse. I think it's more impactful site to have it. Um, and I just wanted to thank all the people involved here through my department. There were four supervisors there. The entire administrative unit is really critical to pulling this off. There are technology experts and make sure we have internet connections and that all the technology tools work. Um, uh, unfortunately, Sam wasn't able to be there in person because he was actually presenting in Shimon County at a live victim impact panel, but uh, he's been a huge asset for, for many, many years. Uh, He's our primary speaker. 
but there were also both DWI officers, two other senior POs who were previously DWI officers. So there's a lot of investment in making this happen and having it come off smoothly and be a good program. Um, but we're very definitely very glad to be back in the courthouse. We've currently got 88 people on supervision for DWI right now, so 62 of, of them went and uh, some of the others may have already gone to one of our panels earlier this year. So uh, it's a very important component of our DWI supervision. Do you, have, do you have the date for your next one? Yes, uh, Carla said it's November 15th is our next one and the next one after that will be March 20th of 2024. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. I also want, I just wanted to say our day reporting numbers are, are way up. We're hovering right around nine, 10 people a day, which is great. Um, so the utilization of that, that ATI is um, coming back, bouncing back from the COVID we're, days where we were only allowed to have five or six people there at a time for the social distancing. We've also got quite a few uh, community agencies expressing an interest in coming there to expand our programming. Uh, we recently started working with Robert Mateo from Visions Federal Credit Union. He's providing weekly classes there, things like establishing credit, how to improve your credit. Uh, last week he did the psychology of spending, which was very well received by people there, and some budgeting things as well. But we're also looking at adding some life skills classes and a SNAP nutrition educator has recently requested to come back in to, to do some nutrition classes and teach people how to maximize their SNAP benefits for healthy eating. So we're excited about exploring those. Um, community service programs, really busy. They're pretty tied up right now with dump and run from Cornell. I think they've finally removed all of the items that the students have left to donate. So they're storing and sorting all of that, preparing for the sale. We will be having a sale in August, and it's in the old Bonton Home Goods store across from the Bonton clothing section. We only have one storefront this year. Last year we had two. We actually have more items this year than we had last year. So we're gonna have to uh, engage in some restocking efforts, which, you know, as, as we sell things, we'll have to bring more things out. And all, again, all of those funds go to the Cops, Kids, and Toys program. So as far as the regular supervision, our, our numbers are creeping back up closer to where we were pre-COVID. Staff's very busy. And uh, it feels like we're uh, getting into the active season of, of summertime <laughs> where there's a lot of people having a lot of issues right now. So. We got all hands on deck trying to help everybody get their needs met. Yeah, I see you're at 263 in May, and that does- 200, 263 for what? Uh, under supervision. And then oh, no. that does seem to have moved up, trended well, we're, up. We're at 436. Okay, what am I, oh, this is the monthly snapshot of open cases in enhanced sentencing and supervision options. So, okay. Yeah, we've got 436 active criminal court cases right now. Actually, 20% of those are DWIs with the 88. We've got, uh, we had 70 investigations going, about 60 people involved with our family court supervision program, so. Okay, questions, questions for probation? I see we have a resolution, but anybody have any comments, questions? All right. The resolution is reappropriation of pretrial grant for benefit of the pretrial program of Tompkins County, ID 11719. And if somebody would move that, Veronica moves. Uh, Mike seconds. Okay. Um, do you want to speak to this, Dan? Certainly. Um, last fall was sort of a surprise from the state that we were given $121,000 and change to support our pretrial program. It was not money that had 
been expected, it was sort of given to all the counties on a prorated basis for how many pretrial supervisions they had done. Because it had never happened before, we weren't really certain how to how to appropriate it or what to do with it. Um, and again, there had been some assurances that this was going to become an annual thing, but again, they're still talking about being an annual thing, but no one knows how much they will get once again. So we would like to have that money reappropriated to our budget so that we can utilize it to support our ongoing uh, pretrial supervision, which involves one supervisor and a full-time probation assistant title. Also, our electronic monitoring and other ATIs that we use with pretrial folks. And there was no end date specified on when this money had to be spent by. So we think it's appropriate that it be reallocated to our, so that we can access it. Okay. Questions or comments? I assume everybody thinks we want the money. I'll call the roll. Mike? Yes, please. Ann? Yes. Veronica? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Okay, so that passes. Well, anything, thank you. Yes. Um, anything further for probation department? No, I think that's it. Okay. All right, seeing no questions, I'd move on to assigned counsel, and I see Lance is with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, I'll be real quick. I know that's going to disappoint people. Uh, nothing, nothing new to really update on here. Uh, you know, we're continuing, you know, our our caseloads are, are maintaining their levels. Uh, we're probably a little heavier in family court right now than, than criminal cases. Um, in, um, but that's not unusual for us actually. Um, but, but that's really about it. If there are no questions or anything, I can, I can give you back the time. Okay, any questions for assigned counsel this month? Yeah. Looks like we're all good. I, so I thought huh? I had one more question for Dan. I forgot. Oh, we're going to go back to probation for a second. Dan? Yeah. Dan, um, so I want to, I'm sorry I missed the, um, the victim impact. Was that through your department, right? Or probation, yes. right? Yes. So, I'm sorry I missed that uh, one yesterday. Uh, I had a conflict, but I really want to try and go to that. Do uh, What's the time of the November 15th? Is that around like 4 or 5 o'clock, right? It starts at 6 o'clock. The six doors open at 5.30, and they actually close at 6. They don't allow anyone else in after 6. Okay. All righty. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you. Okay. Is there any other business to come before the um, Public Safety Committee? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Veronica moves and seconds. All those in favor, we'll do that on a, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.